Hello and thanks for joining us on Encore. Coming up in today's show. From Edward Hopper's Lone Diners to Andy Warhol's endless multicoloured screen prints, writer Olivia Lang explores the art of being alone. Her book, The Lonely City, takes us on a trip through the urban artistic landscape of the 20th century and up into the present day. Olivia joins us in the studio to tell us more. Olivia, thanks so much for joining us. Total pleasure. Your book, The Lonely City, uh, it's centred on New York, but do you think every city is inherently a bit lonely? I think cities can be very lonely places. They're places of massive population density, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're spaces in which it's easy to make connections, and I think people have been increasingly finding that. Yeah, the whole exploration of your book actually focuses on this question. When surrounded by people, mm. how, how do we feel alone or, or in community? Could you read an extract of the book to let I us know? I totally could. There were things that burned away at me, not only as a private individual, but also as a citizen of our century, our pixelated age. What does it mean to be lonely? How do we live if we're not intimately engaged with another human being? How do we connect with other people, particularly if we don't find speaking easy? Is sex a cure for loneliness? And if it is, what happens if our body or sexuality is considered deviant or damaged, if we are ill or unblessed with beauty? And is technology helping with these things? Does it draw us closer together or trap us behind screens? I was by no means the only person who puzzled over these questions. All kinds of writers, artists, filmmakers and songwriters have explored the subject of loneliness in one way or another, attempting to gain purchase on it, to tackle the issues that it provokes. But I was at the time beginning to fall in love with images, to find a solace in them that I didn't find elsewhere, and so I conducted the majority of my investigations within the realm of visual art. I was possessed with a desire to find correlates, physical evidence other people had inhabited my state, and during my time in Manhattan, I began to gather up works of art that seemed to articulate or be troubled by loneliness, particularly as it manifests in the modern city, and even more particularly, as it has manifested in the city of New York over the past 70 or so years. And indeed, one of the artists you talk about is Edward Hopper and also Andy Warhol. These are people who are phenomenally successful, very well known. Their art has, been, has connected to millions of people. But you get the impression that their emotional or personal lives weren't so successful. Do you think there's a link? Do I think there's a link between the art they are making and their lives? Mm. Absolutely, I do think there's a link. I don't think that a person's um, own emotional state or biographical experience necessarily tells us everything about their art, but in these two cases, I think it can be really interesting to, to look at it. And Edward Hopper was married, but nonetheless, he was somebody who really struggled to make connection. He described himself as a lonely one, and he... Um, he was a very private, very silent man. And I think that sort of sense of being um, estranged from the world around him absolutely reverberates through his images, these sort of beautiful paintings of people trapped in rooms, either alone or in twos, but without communication between them, with these real force fields of silence. And then Warhol, who we think of as the consummate socialite of the 20th century, I mean, he's always at parties. Nonetheless, he's surrounded by people, but he's using technology to mediate those encounters. And you rarely see him without a camera, a tape recorder, some sort of machinery that allows him both to draw people to him, but also to hold them at a distance. And I found that so fascinating in our own world, where everybody permanently has an iPhone in their hand. Indeed, you point out that Warhol was very prescient about his attitude to people's relationships mm. with machines. And in the book, you mentioned that your companion was almost a MacBook, a, a laptop. Mm. Do you see these objects as friends or foe? Oh, I think they're both, really. I think a, the thing about the internet for the lonely person is that it allows you to form connections with people who don't share your physical space. And that is such a blessing, especially if you live somewhere where... You're isolated, you're not like the people around you, you're a gay kid in Texas, say. 
But on the other hand, the internet is this dangerous space for people in terms of the pressure to perform a kind of achieved sociability, to look like your life is beautifully, richly social and populated. And I think that's an enormous pressure for people, especially for young people. So I think it's friend and it's foe at the same time. Indeed, you talk about the, the potential for the dehumanising effect of, of screens and mm. this idea that virtual exclusion is, is very dangerous. Mm. And I think um, anyone who spends time on Twitter or Facebook, especially Twitter where there's a sense that there's conversation going on and you can just slip out of it, you can get lost inside it. And that feeling of, oh God, I'm, I'm being cut out, I'm being edged out of this, it's almost a teenage feeling. It's like being in a, in a school playground again. And I think it really it brings up those sort of quite raw feelings about exclusion and connection. Mm -hmm. Well, you gave a reading of The Lonely City at Shakespeare and Company, the bookshop here in Paris. We went to hear about what people thought about the book and about its subject matter. I find it so fascinating how the work of these artists can, can speak to that condition and let us know that wherever we are, actually there are always people in, in that community and that something that's shared like that is, is not shameful or, or, uh, or problematic. Coming here into Paris, I'm actually able to do everything I've ever wanted to. I can sit alone and eat, I can just roam about in a bookstore alone without people actually thinking that something is wrong with me. So I can actually uh, quite um, connect with what she's saying about the shamefulness that is related, so related to loneliness. And people don't really understand the difference between being alone and being lonely. Indeed, that young lady brings up the question of shame with relation to being a woman alone in the city. And I found that interesting. In, in the book, you reflect upon that, this question of gender. Is it different? Oh, God, it's so different. It's absolutely different, yeah. And I think um, I really wrestled with that in the book. That I'm talking about these men who experience loneliness but could also be the flaneur. They could wander through the city. They're the ones who are looking out. They're not aware of being looked back at. And I think for women, there's so much shame attached to being alone, being a spinster, having having that sort of cultural weight on you. It's very hard to just experience the joy of being alone when you're aware that you're also being perceived as a lone object, and particularly as a sexual object, whether you're desirable or whether you're failing as a sexual object. That sort of pressure is there, and it's very, very hard to avoid. And there's an idea also of sexual freedom in the city, specifically related to uh, David Wanarovich. That's the late 70s and 80s in New York. Mm. In the intervening time, how do you think things have evolved in the city? In terms of sexual freedoms, well, I mean, what happened to David Wonorovich is that he died of AIDS. That, that sort of moment of sexual liberation in, in New York City really closed down because of AIDS. And I think that's probably true globally as well, that there then became a lot more fear about sexual encounters. You know, now, again, technology is coming back into the conversation that there's Grindr, there are all these different, there's Tinder, there are all these different apps that people can use. So they facilitate um, sexual connection, but there isn't necessarily the same amount of the sort of physical physical and social exchange that there used to be in a city. So I think we, we have got more removed, we have got more separated. And speaking of the evolution of cities, you evoke this question of gentrification, that Manhattan has become this gated island for the super rich. Uh, dramatic contrast to previous years. How do you think that process is affecting artistic output globally? I think it's affecting it hugely. Actually, it's interesting. I was looking, um, I was on Twitter yesterday and one of my favourite bookstores in Manhattan, Three Lives, which is an extraordinary bookshop, um, a real parallel to Shakespeare and Company, has just lost its rent. It, it can't stay there after 30 years. So there is this sense that these cultural spaces are closing down, are being pushed to the margins. If artists can't afford to rent spaces, if artists can't afford to you know, work in these kind of spaces, then our cities become so much the poorer for it. So I think gentrification is a dreadful force for creativity. OK. Now, you uh, obviously find a lot of consolation in art. It's the focus mm -hmm. of your books, and you write about it beautifully. Uh, which piece of art is your go-to object or experience to feel less lonely? Gosh, that's a hard question. So many. I mean, David Wonorovich's work is absolutely extraordinary. He's, he's this American artist who... He died of AIDS in 1992 at the age of 37, appallingly young. And he made this wonderful body of work, films, photographs, uh, paintings. And I think what draws me still so deeply to his work is that it's so political. It's so invested in exploring the ways that societies um, stigmatise and isolate communities like the gay community. 
and um, people of colour. You know, he talks about those things very early on, and his work is is just radiantly beautiful. So if I was to describe one image, it would be the one of him with his with his lips sewn shut. It's a very famous image. He's just looking out at the camera, out at the viewer, and it's it's captivating. It says, I'm a person, I'm here, and I'm losing my voice, and I refuse to lose my voice. Okay, that's a very strong image there. We also asked you to flag up one other piece of music that you'd recommend to us, and you cited Arthur Russell's That's Us Wild Combination. Can you tell us about this choice? Yeah, this is an artist, again, who died of AIDS, an, an American artist, and he made very, very beautiful experimental music. He was an interesting pioneer because he was in the um, avant-garde music community and the disco community, so he was sort of crossing borders in a way that people don't tend to now, and he... Um, he just made things that were very beautiful, very joyous, and this this song, I think, is um, it's a heart opener. That's how I describe it. Okay. Well, we'll leave you with some of Arthur Russell's music. Thank you for joining us, Olivia. Thank you. And thank you at home for watching. Remember, you can get more arts and culture news on our website. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. Yeah,